Um, I'm going to start by telling you that English isn't my native language either. And I end up getting a little stressed and my accent thickens up. And if you don't understand me, just stop me because I get really excited. And I'm going to talk about football, so I'm going to get really excited. So feel free to stop me. Um, this is a talk that I've been working on since the World Cup. I was invited to give a talk in an art space in Vilnius during the World Cup. And I wasn't interested in anything but football at the time. Like, I literally almost canceled the trip because I cleared my entire schedule during the World Cup so I could just watch three games a day. But they promised me that the talk will not be during a game and that they'll take me to watch football the rest of the time. Um, but it's actually not really a talk about football. What it is, is it's a talk about photography. And it starts with this line from a book that has become like the gift that keeps on giving to me. I read it about once a month. It's beautiful. It's Camera Lucida by Roland Bart. And this line, the first man who saw the first photograph, if we accept me, Sepp, who made it, must have thought it was a painting. Same framing, same perspective. Photography has been, and is still, tormented by the ghost of painting. Um, so I'm going to start romantically, and I'll start with touching people. So have you ever touched someone and thought about Bernini? Specifically, this Bernini, the right for Proserpina um, from 1621 to 1622, a sculpture depicting the abduction of Persephone um, by Pluto, or Hades, in Greek, the lord of the underground. Baroque sculptor Bernini chose the height of the action just as Pluto gets hold of the goddess and she struggles to break free. He grabs her, his agile chiseled hands against her soft stone body. Pluto presses his fingers against her thigh and hip. Her contour becomes malleable. It's shaped by his grip. This is marble. It, could, it would be cold to the touch. And still I think about it all the time. The violent subject notwithstanding, it's desire. And it is a desire that could only be told via mythology, an experience formalized elsewhere. I download a high resolution image of the sculpture and zoom in her marble flesh, his long fingers. They're both familiar and astounding to me all at once. A simpler example, have you ever been in a landscape and thought about a landscape painting? Have you thought about Monet or Claude Laurent? The history of art mediates the way that we see the world. This is a talk about that, just about how we see art in the world around us. But it's also about what artworks we bring up in our minds as we stand in a landscape or upload a photograph to the internet. Um, and it's about an, what idea of art it is that we see and then post to Instagram. Um, it's also an essay about football. And thus, it is also an essay about time and memory, about the gap between the decisive moment and the moment that precedes it, about how we experience things through representation. It begins with a footballer who's celebrating a goal, and it ends with memory and possibly with loss. And finally, this is an essay about representation. It looks to football as an example of an experience mediated by different diverging forms, from photography and live television to different layers of language, like punditry and commentary and analysis. And then it asks why we see art in all of these things. Number two, sight. I see photographs everywhere, like everyone else nowadays. They come from the world to me without my asking. They are only images. Their mode of appearance is heterogeneous. Also from Camera Lucida, obviously. I told you it was a gift that keeps on giving. Um, Camera Lucida comes out in 1980. It's just three years after Susan Sontag publishes On Photography. In the first page of which she writes, photographs thicken the environment we consider as modern. I think about this line all the time. So I've been following this project for like a year now, where I just read 1980s and 1970s photo theory, trying to understand what it says about technology, like whether there is any way to look at John Berger or Susan Sontag and see something in it today. Because that like idea that photographs thicken the environment that we consider modern seems really different today when we upload 851 Instagram photos, just Instagram, every single second, which means, wait, I calculated this the other day, 75 million images a day, which means that in about every minute, we upload more images to the internet than photographs that existed 150 years ago. So like 150 years ago, there were less images in the entire world than we upload to the internet in just a minute. And I have this whole other talk about sustainability of the internet and how like basically porn is the result of all our problems because the, like all 
inter all imagery or video oriented internet is the internet that like has brought about global warming basically. Um, but I'm also interested in images and I'm interested in like this proliferation of images. Um, and I think that because we as viewers like as a society share more references because we share more images between us. Um, I think it's also the argument that Susan Sontag makes when she says that in the environment we consider modern, that more things look more like other things, and that more things are recognizable to us because we have more access and exposure to visual imagery. Um, it's like a shared consciousness that's basically just born in media. Um, and so I'm trying to think about like this like saturated media society that we live in, um, and I'm taking one example that I'm obsessed about as a way to explore like how we share images and like exactly what kind of art it is that we see in things. And this is where Dele Alley comes in. Um, does anyone here watch football? Yes, I do. Two people who are of mine. Yeah. Um, okay, so this talk starts with this image. Um, I don't support Tottenham, but this photograph was released on April 1st, 2018. This is, what you're seeing is this footballer who's like 22 years old, really, really good, very talented, called Dele Alley, just scored his second goal against Chelsea. They're both London teams, they hate each other with a burning passion. Chelsea are like the old racist rich one. Um, they're owned by Roman Abramovich, they're like Russian oligarch. Um, at this point, when they're playing this game, Tottenham has not won against Chelsea in about 20 years. But Chelsea are not doing very well. They have like a very fancy Italian manager who like managed the Italian national team just before. Um, and they are number five in the league, even though they won the league the year before. So this is like this moment of explosion. Like it's pr pretty much the first time that Tottenham are gonna win against them in 20 years. Um, it's like minute 70 and he has just scored a goal and he's celebrating in front of the audience. And the second beforehand, he put his hand near, near his ear being like, I can't hear you but he definitely heard them. Um, you probably heard the Chelsea fans that were like berating him and yelling at him because he's sitting in front of this, this crowd and he's shouting and then you see everyone else there. I have some details. I love that guy with the coffee who like just gave up completely. <laughs> um, I love that guy who was like, oh my God, hold me. I can't take this anymore. Um, <coughs> here that I was really interested in was it just the fact that there was a woman in that one um, I just grabbed all of these images like all of these details for you um, but I think actually I'm gonna go back up to the original one bit because of, there's a flat flatness to this image that's like really obviously painterly right like it looks familiar there are layers of it um, from him in the forefront to like every because it's like built as a staircase like you see them going up and up and up um, I found this image through someone on Twitter who posted it on Twitter, obviously went crazy viral. And what he posted was, this photo of Della Alley getting abused by Chelsea fans after scoring is like a giant Renaissance canvas. The more you look, the more characters and possible backstories you discover. So like, the internet then played that wonderful game of like, tag yourself, who are you? I'm definitely the guy with the coffee cup, just saying. Um, and then one user said, this reminds me of this classic. He writes and adds this photograph. This is Thierry Henry in 2002, scoring for Arsenal against Tottenham, another London team, Arsenal. Um, it's a legendary goal, and the photograph in the wake of it is even more mythical. Henry on his knees, his gaze lowered, flanked by these two security guards um, and all the berating fans in front of him. The guy who posted it on Twitter says, that's almost as old as a Renaissance painting, another user answers, and he says, that's newer. Mm -hmm. um, this is Emmanuel Adebayor playing for Manchester City, but he beforehand played for Arsenal. What you're seeing is him playing at Manchester City. To the left, all the fans wearing Manchester City colors. To the right, all of the Arsenal fans of his former team. Um, I feel like we can all like, agree that there's a very, very painterly quality to these. Um, but part of what I'm interested in is thinking, sorry, my notes are, is like thinking about these through the things I learned in art history. So like I look at Henri and I look at him on his knees surrounded by two guards and I think about like devotional paintings with like, you know, Christ and the Madonna and the two donor portraits on the side. And I look at the triangular composition that happens there that like dates back to medieval times, right? 
the triangle has a symbolic meaning that it stands for the Holy Trinity, but it also has a practical effect, which means that like the perspective always focuses on the same thing. And here there's like these two colors, that, like yellow and Henri's red, that like really focuses you. It's where all the lines meet. <coughs> and that even though the photograph echoes this religious arrangement and the player is kneeling, we also know exactly where our eyes should rest. And we know this because we've seen this composition before. Sorry, these are just my papers like mm -hmm. being thrown everywhere. Um, so this methodology of like looking to the history of art is obviously not mine. Um, this is what Don John Berger does um, in Ways of Seeing from 1972, which is still a hallmark reference for all image culture reading. So he charted all of the recognizable traits of the history of art in the way that subjects like come time and time again. So the subject that he looks Oh, sorry, I have one read again there. The subject that he looks at is this photograph of Che Guevara's body, and then he compares it to Jacques David's Death of Marat, to Mantegna's The Lamentation Over the Dead Christ, to Rembrandt's The Anatomy Lesson of Dr. So you see how like these images, like all of these things remind us of all of these things. All of these things keep coming up. And the, to recognize like this kind of triangular composition means to recognize order in the world, to wade through all of the visual surplus that we're all living through, and find meaning in an image through art, and find understanding through art. This methodology, you know, it starts with John Berger, and it ends up being so popular that a few years ago, it became a meme. I have this collection of images finding the golden race. This is a fight in the Ukrainian parliament in 2016. Um, this is amazing. <laughs> um, and then there's this one, which I'm fascinated by. So this is an image of New Year's Eve in Manchester. Um, the UK has this, cult, like I've lived in London, they have this culture of shaming people for getting drunk, even though everybody drinks a lot in the UK. Um, <laughs> so there's this Manchester photo that went viral. The photographer that took it, I think, posted it on Instagram. It got photographed and shared everywhere. Um, and a lot of people refer to it as a Baroque painting. Um, and the Guardian's art critic, wait, I have a clean image of it. Um, the Guardian's art critic, Jonathan Jones, who's not a very good art critic, just like in some professional competition there, wrote this article titled, Sistine Perfection or Pissed Up Manchester Street? Let's put things in perspective. From this article, what a silly start to 2016 in art. For the difference between this photograph and a Renaissance painting are far larger than any similarities. Taking a picture is so very different to making one. All those Renaissance compositions weren't quickly shot on the go. Um, there is nothing quick about them. Artists in those days trained for years in drawing, painting, and sculpting under exacting apprenticeship and conditions. And when they did start making art in their own right, it was deeply skilled and deeply in, in, in a difficult enterprise. And while I'm not interested well, I am kind of interested in matching images to like old paintings, but like, that's not what I want to do. I don't want to find like the perfect match for this, even though if you want, email me and I will send you mm -hmm. all of the like, there's like this in the bathing of Aniers. There's these like, there's that character then photoshopped into other paintings. It's kind of great. Like, like there is one of these with like, the woman of Alger, the Delacroix painting, and it is perfection. It's always like lying in front of them. Um, it's all pretty perfect. <laughs> um, but what I'm interested in is the fact that Jonathan Jones is being way too conservative there. And that what makes something art isn't the quote unquote scale or quote unquote enterprise, but the effect. Um, yes, there are preparatory drawings for Renaissance paintings. And yes, there are all this planning for compositions that he describes. But yes, just like the person taking this photograph and like whoever internet user that like superimposed the golden spiral on it and like many other internet users who shared it, the Renaissance artists and the contemporary makers and the viewers all saw the same thing in it, which is life, like a window into a moment. Um, and part of the argument that I'm trying to make is that like seeing Renaissance paintings in this or Baroque paintings in this helps us make sense of a world we can't, we literally can't understand. Like when you think about this as a Baroque painting and you think about how like, why this is the one image that was released from the G20 um, summit in 2018, it's because like 
all of the composition all centers on Angela Merkel because the color system works, because the lighting makes it look so ominous. All of it is something that is legible to us. It's a world painting, right? And all of a sudden, it allows us to have like a visual system that doesn't explain the world. Like, I mean, I can't explain to you why there's like a five-year-old boy there who's like the leader of the free world, but it does allow me to like try and analyze how things are represented, why things are like dispersed and mediated, um, especially in a world that's like so full of images. Number five. A Pieta. Um, I notice how religious all of this is, um, but it's not my religion. Um, anyway, here's a Pieta. This is an image of Frank Lampard, who is a Chelsea midfielder. This is from like 2005. He had scored a goal playing a game just after his mother passed away. And I mean, it surely rained that day. He's covered in mud, he's like flanked by his teammates. There's something about this that's just like so full of emotion. It's too personal. It feels like we're almost intruding on this moment that he is having on his own. It's really like a pieta to me. I and mean, it looks like a pieta, again, because of that triangular composition that really reg resonates with the religious iconography. But it looks like a pieta even more so because it is an imagery that's heavy and laden with really raw emotion. And such images of pain are the subject of religion. Which leads me back to Dele Alli um, celebrating in front of the Chelsea fans. And then I wonder, is it a Renaissance painting like people said it was? The subject matter and the treatment, so like a multi-figure tableau that stretches vertically where the viewer's eye wanders across the central focus point, which is Dele Alli, across all the rows of the fans who are flattened to a picture frame behind him. It all rings really familiar. <coughs> so what kind of a painting is it? So if it's, a, if it's a Renaissance painting, if we're going to play that game, it's not an Italian Renaissance painting. It's not a Raphael, even though he was the king of the triangular composition. It's Northern Renaissance painting. It'll either be these like vertical compositions that you see in Geronimo Spalch that are like full of m many, many figures in them, or it'll be the like moralizing, ah, this is the moment where like the image isn't like high quality enough, it looks great on my computer. But you could see that the faces of the people in the ship of bones are very much like berated, um, partly because painting in the Northern Renaissance is very much about like an ethics and a value system, right? So like they're supposed to like educate you. And then the other person I'm thinking of is Borgel. Because even though your eye goes to a specific scene, right, and that becomes the title of the work, just like your eye goes straight to Del Alley, um, there's also a million other scenes there. There's like the little like fire by the motel, there's the people ice skating, there are people selling stuff in the back. Um, so I think that like um, the comparison between Bruegel and Bosch doesn't make a ton of sense because they're like a hundred years apart. But then I found a book, I was doing research for this in the British Library, and I found this amazing book um, from 2016 called Bosch and Bruegel, From Enemy Painting to Everyday Life, um, that like, made the argument that both, both Bosch and Bruegel together are the originators of the genre painting, and that they both, like, even though they're associated with like, either like, small street scenes like this, or like, the monsters in Bosch, um, the paintings are all experiments in storytelling that stretch across the canvas, just like the football images. Um, and then there's another thing about these multi-people scene, which is that they're also supposed to tell you something about human behavior in when we're like in big societies and big groups of people. So in Bruegel, it's the fight between Carnival and Lent. You see the like struggle between the like, religious values and pretty much wanting to party. Um, but I think there is something else in these images. Um, in the Bush and in the Bruegel images, which is tenderness. I feel like both painters really display like this like empathy towards their subjects. Like they're not ridiculing their subjects. What they're communicating is a certain value system of the society that they lived in, but there is no judgment in it, which is something that I think about a lot when I think about how when that Del Alley photo was posted on Twitter and everyone was like, tag yourself, I'm the guy with the coffee. There's ridicule in that. But there's also this desire to see ourselves in images, to like represent ourselves, to experience this like shared humanity. Which leads me to 
humanity. Um, just, just a little pause in the middle of my argument um, so I could talk about like, the possibility of identification. Um, this is Mo Salah, um, possibly one of the most amazing football players to have emerged in the last few years. He joined this British team called Liverpool last year, and he had the best first season that anyone could ever imagine. He won the biggest footballing award, he scored the most goal in, goals in the league, he assimilated into a really fast and really wonderful team. He's also an Egyptian player who is Muslim, devout, wears a beard. Um, which, I mean, there's a lot of Muslim players in football. There aren't a lot that like wear a beard and talk about their faith in the same kind of openness that like Christian Brazilian players talk about their faith. And I look at this image of him kneeling and the entire audience behind him, and I know what they're singing. What they're singing, about halfway through the season, they started singing this song, which is based on the song Good Enough by the English band Dodgy. Um, and the lyrics are, if he's good enough for you, he's good enough for me. If he scores another few, then I'll be Muslim too. If he's good enough for you, he's good enough for me. Sitting in a mosque, that's where I want to be. Um, so I've heard them sing this when I was like watching football on television, and I didn't fully understand the lyrics except for like, oh my god, these are a bunch of like racist British people singing about wanting to be in a mosque. And then I found the lyrics on this like Liverpool fan site called The Red Man TV. And the preface to it is, the song is proof that football is more than just a game. It breaks down barriers and brings people together. No matter who you are, football doesn't judge. That's just my little break, break on humanity. I can go back to versions. Um, so, a football pitch, just like a canvas, is a predetermined aesthetic system. Almost every photograph from a football game would focus on the player, would include an audience in the background, would freeze the frame in a specific moment. Stadiums used to not allow cameras. Before smartphones, there wasn't like a proliferation of different images from different angles into it. There was basically only one allowed image that came out of everywhere. Um, that's an exception in, only in like hobbyist leagues and in women's football. Obviously, because no one cared about photographing women's football until like maybe two years ago. Um, but part of the thing I was interested in is this idea that like you only get one image of every moment, basically. And that image is often taken from the stands. It would often be like a close-up of the of the player, this moment of the shot, or like the celebration after the goal. Um, and I was just interested in this idea of like moments and sights. So this is from ways of seeing. An image is a sight which has been recreated or reproduced. It is an appearance or a set of appearances which has been detached from the place and time in which, it's made its, in which it first made its appearance and preserved for a few moments or a few centuries. Every time we look at a photograph, we are aware, however slightly, of the photo photographer selecting that sight from an infinity of other possible sights. So photography is, to this day, even after smartphones have made our relationship to the camera really, really different, that like I use my smartphone as like a mirror when I put makeup on. Um, it's still inseparable from this idea of the decisive moment that was defined by this French photographer called Henri Cartier-Bresson. Henri Cartier-Bresson. Um, the decisive moment means capturing an event, an ephemeral thing, by creating an image that can stand for the whole, and mo a moment that communicates the essence of the thing. So how can I look at that Dele Alli, Dele Alli photo and claim that it's something special? There are so many photographs of this event from so many different angles, and for some reason, they all have a really different effect, right? So this is the one that I keep using. This is the one that shows that, like, I can't hear you. This one is just cropped in a different way, and it's still less effective. It's like, it makes this really great argument for composition, right? But I think, Part of the reason that I think football is such a good example for all of these questions about vision and sight and photography is that football's relationship to time is really particular. So even though I'm a pretty obsessed football fan, I illegally stream almost all the games I watch. So I go on Reddit and I find like an illegal stream for it. And I very often will like, talk to my friend Harry who lives in Berlin on the phone or on Skype while I'm streaming. And my internet connection is not that great. So it'll pause or like, I wouldn't understand this, but I'll be like 30 seconds behind Harry. So as we're talking, they're like, goal! And I'm like, no, I haven't seen it yet. I don't know what's happening. 
And then I'd be like, I'm in minute 1816 now. Where are you? He'd be like, I'm in 1905. I won't tell you anything for 40 seconds after it happens. So we have this like amazing relationship between us where we try to like surpass time between us as we're talking on the phone or texting. Um, this is the introduction to this beautiful book called Football that was published last year. A football match immediately ceases to be interesting as soon as we know the final results. As soon as the invisible thread connecting football to the passage of time is broken, as soon as it is stripped of its dimension of irreversibility, its grace and brilliance immediately vanish. Um, so that invisible, invis uh, sorry, that invisible thread that connects football to the passage of time is, in our experience as viewers, quite visible, right? It's like a system of representation. It's a video camera that you'll often see because the players that like, scored a goal are running to the camera and are celebrating in front of the camera, so all of a sudden you'll see like, the inside of the mouth of a player or something. Um, right now, there's this really weird expansion of time that happened in the last World Cup where they're using video assistance. So, like, they go back, they pause the game, they make like a television motion to say that they're gonna go to this thing called VAR. And then someone who sits on a television in a control room tells the, the referee what happened and confirms his decision. That's a really weird relationship to time. Um, so photography has its own weird, weird relationship to time. In Cowardly Sita, again, the gift that keeps on giving, Bart writes about a photograph as document, um, that the photo is supposed to be a confirmation of a fact, that what we're looking for is the knowledge that something happened. He writes about this photo of Polish soldiers by Emmerich Kertisch from 1915, that they were there, that what I see is not a memory, an imagination, a reconstitution, a piece of Maya, such as art lavishes upon us, but reality in a past state, at once the past and the real. I love this line, at once the past and the real. And I think that it's part of football's like fragile, fascinating relationship to time. The fact that the pleasure is gone the second you know the score, but the also the fact that the second you know the goal, that like decisive moment you saw it happen, you immediately want to replay. You immediately want to experience it again. Every time I've seen a game live, and I haven't seen many games live, the second I saw a goal, the first thing I was like, I kind of regretted not watching it streaming on my laptop because I couldn't see the goal again. Like you want the pleasure and the experience and the beauty without any, having any of that hesitation of like, get in, will it go in, will it not go in? Um, and I think that this fragile relationship to time, which is so visible when you consider these specific systems of viewing, right, like live, replays, still photography, is partly why we see Renaissance paintings in it. The fragile thread that Toussaint talks about when he connects fight football to time is also an emotional thing. In philosopher Simon Critchley's book, What We Talk About When We Talk About Football, there's a section where Zidane, Zinedine Zidane, the like, famous French player, talks about um, how he wanted to get really close to the television to watch football as a kid because he really liked the sound of the French commentator. He liked the voice of, his, of this person. When Zidane used to play himself as a professional, he said that he would commentate on everything he did in his head in this person's sound. Um, as a kid, you weren't just playing, you were playing and fantasizing at the same time, distancing yourself from something. Okay, last part. Loneliness, because whenever I post like, any mention of this lecture, people are like, wait, is the rally actually lonely? I'm, I'm going to get to it. And trying to get to an ending because I haven't actually finished this talk. Um, but the title was like always tentative. Like The loneliness is just something that I kind of saw in it, right? Like, Del Alley doesn't seem that lonely. He's like, in front of all these Chelsea fans, but like, what you don't see in the frame is that I'm sure all of his mates, all of the other football players, are running to celebrate with him. Like, in a second, someone's going to touch him, someone's going to lift him, someone's going to hug him, someone's going to celebrate with him. But in this moment, I feel like I see something that shouldn't be visible. It's like this form of fragility, this like David and Goliath image. Like, this is one in front of the masses, and for this one moment, he's alone. And he looks really small, and that's why it seems really lonely to me. And the other day, I was talking to a friend of mine about Mo Salah, and he said that the reason everybody loves Mo Salah so much is that when he's playing, he like looks like he's living his childhood dream at every given moment. He's like so excited about playing football all the time. 
And sometimes when I watch this thing, like I have to like remind myself that I'm watching like eleven billionaires chase eleven other billionaires, <laughs> and that all of this is like a global system of entertainment. But I then wonder about that tenderness that I was talking about in Bruegel, and I wonder about what it means to watch, to look, to pay that much attention to other people live. Um, I feel like. I watch football and I sometimes almost forget that it's live. And like it just seems crazy that like the same thing is happening as I'm on my like laptop and that they're feeling all of this like adrenaline. But then I felt adrenaline before giving talks or before teaching a first class. I felt fascinated, I felt scared. I feel like there's only like the level of identification that I feel with these eleven billionaires is crazy except for the fact that they feel something that I will never be able to feel. Like, I identify with them for 90 minutes of like human intimacy and identification, except for the fact that I'm sure that they, when someone scores a goal, the second he kicks the ball, they know if it's going in or not. So there's this like two seconds of broken time between me and them. They know, like instinctively, they know if it's going in or not, and I can't tell that yet. Um, and that's part of the thing that I'm like so interested in. Is like, how do you empathize? How do you sympathize? How do you see that in images? Um, so I looked through a lot of like the most famous images of football to think about these questions of identification. Um, so this is a photo of Bobby Moore, one of the most famous English players, with Pelé, like best football player of all times. This is the end of the group stage, the World Cup in 1970, England versus Brazil. The game had just ended. They're just changing their shirts. It looks like every photo of Marilyn Monroe, right, with like all of the photographers around them. I have stared at this photo so much. 1970, like 15 years before I was born. I don't remember that World Cup. And I realized that there's something that this image wouldn't communicate to me. You can't tell who won. It's like this amazing sense of intimacy, but you can't actually know everything from photography. You can't understand everything from an image, not all narrative. Okay, my attempt at an ending is to tie it back to art. <laughs> um, so this is Adela Desmet's coup de tête. You know what this moment is. It's Zidane headbutting Materazzi, Italian player, France versus Italy, 2006 final of the World Cup. France lost on penalties, Zidane was sent on a red card. It's all very tragic. Um, and here's the other one. Remember that really famous photo of Henri that I showed you earlier? It is now a sculpture outside of the Emirates State. Like, you see this from the street in North London when you walk there. Um, it's this amazing con like conversion from image <coughs> to sculpture to art to public art to an understanding of like how football also, like, or just like how this like, social experience affects our sense of space. Here's another thing from Susan Sontag's on photography. Photography has the unappealing reputation of being the most realistic and therefore easy of the mimetic arts. In fact, it is the one art that has managed to carry out the grandiose, century-old threat of surrealism taking over the modern sensibility, while most of the pedigreed candidates have dropped out of the race. Because we also look to art to explain the world to us, like I talked about before, right? To make an image of something, to fight against forgetting. Um, just on the page, in the same page on, on photography, um, she talks about surrealist paintings and says, painters, sorry, and says, they kept a long, prudent distance from surrealism's contentious idea of blurring the line, be the line between art and so-called life between objects and events, between the intended and the unintentional, between pros and amateurs, between the novel and the tawdry, between craftsmanship and lucky blunders. And of course, the thing I'm interested in in this is the idea of a so-called life. Um, I couldn't find an example of a life that's more intense than football, but what I wanted to talk about was always life. I'm thinking of Sontag and of Bach and of Berger, and I'm thinking about the like, less than 10 years between 1972 and 1980, between Ways of Seeing and Camera Lucida coming out. And I think that each one of these is an attempt to, in writing, make sense of the world around them, where visual matter was changing. Remember, Bart says, I see photographs everywhere, like everyone else nowadays. Um, and thus the relationship between art and life was constantly being redefined in those 10 years because society's relationship to images had to be redefined. I'm thinking of the 1970s and wonder what the image of culture was like. 
right, in like classical or contemporary image consciousness. I tried to imagine the streets of London or New York or Paris from the movies that I saw in the 60s, not from anything else. I think of posters, I think of like the texture, the, like the way that photography enriches the environment we think of as modern. Um, I think about all of the advertising signs that Bart would have seen everywhere coming at him from the world. And of course, I'm making the argument that we live in a time of visual flux again. Remember I talked about like numbers earlier and how many photographs we upload every day, trying to astound you with all these numbers and all these images that come from the world to us and that like emerge from our phones. It's like this perfect description still. And what I'm interested in is seeing how we decode this world and how we decode so many images that it brings to us. And on this like sweet, optimistic note of trying to answer it, I want to answer that we read these images according to the terms we share, like the art that we see in life. Um, and then one last thought, also from Camera Lucida. This is like in page 20 or something. I don't know why he didn't close the book with this, but that line is, I am interested in photographs just as I am interested in the world. And that's it. So now we can talk about football if you want. <laughs> Or we can have a drink. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like because I'm behind everyone, yeah. I love like this like invisible just voice, like <laughs> the storyteller. The storyteller. Um, you should see all the papers around me. <laughs> like, very performative in the end. <laughs> Any questions? Do you want to look at Del Alley again? Do you want to look at how gorgeous the Tyrian is? <laughs> I have something to ask you. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I was just wondering why you didn't mention the name of the photojournalist that took these pictures. You know what? I literally don't know. I think this photo, like with Bart, it just came to me. Like I've been obsessing over it since it came out in April 1st. And I was like, I transcribed people talking about it in football podcasts. No one mentions his name. I don't know. I actually don't know where it came from. It like just started circulating, uh, as images tend to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, but I mean, I just think it's it would be very uh, like it would be more interesting to kind of you know um, honor the photojournalists True. that are behind each picture because you know you know you're you're talking about these as if you know they are works of art and you're of course mentioning you know people from you know, uh, art history like Bruegel and other stuff. And I think, you know, this kind of reflects a kind of a bias t mm -hmm. towards, you know, you know, like, cons like considering those paintings like real artists and, and these people, you know, just kind of these like ghosts who just, you know, like happen to take pictures. But, but you know, like if you think about it, which I think, you know, your, your lecture made me think about it right mm -hmm. now that, you know, like I also watch football and like I see, you know, lots of photo photojournalists uh, behind the goals, and you know, these people make hundreds and hundreds and thousands of pictures, and I bet that they're really good at their craft. So, like, I yeah. think that you know, this is no accident that like this photo somehow miraculously turns out as you know, uh, as, as a, the one that comes out because, from all these versions. Because, because I think you know, there is a kind of a sense of, I mean, there is a craft here that needs to be honored. And those are the crafts of the photojournalists. And I just thought that it would have been nicer if you, you know, you know, like took the time to, you know, uh, put their names in here. And and um, and you know, like what what your lecture made me think of what, uh, was, you know, I just had this idea of like, you know, could we maybe look at individual photojournalists? And maybe try to see if they have a consistent style or something. You know, yeah. that would be an interesting thought. So, like, I was thinking about that a lot. But uh, yeah, just um, um, it just like made me think a lot about how we take it for given that you know we it, because you know I also look at lots of these things. But you know, it's actually a craft, and like I would like to know more about these photojournalists. I totally agree. I also think that the difference between this and this is unbelievable. Like the framing changes. I, like that photo is not as memorable. I think part of what I'm doing here, you're right, there should be, like there just should be a credit. 
I'm a little less interested in like the work of the photojournalist, like the loneliness of the photojournalist, maybe, um, sitting there alone in front of all these people celebrating together and living an experience together while that's their job and their labor. Um, part of what I'm trying to do is like think about like this could have been every subject, right? I just love football. Mm -hmm. It's like think about how images come to us and how we make sense of them. So rather than authorship, which I'm a little mm -hmm. less interested like, because I love Bath so much. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I'm a little less interested in asset authorship after reading the death of the author a million times. But I'm interested in like societally what we make of images and how we see them. Like this whole talk starts with like the people who are like tag yourself in this and I was like oh why do we see ourselves in this like this is my current question in life is why do people want to see themselves in yeah, things online? Like, it reminds me of the, the, app, sorry, the, app the Google Apps and culture? Yeah, yes. You have to find your face in, yep. the, in the Renaissance paintings. Yeah, I was interested in that I'm still like not sure how to find a way through it, but I've actually written about the Google apps, mm -hmm. like the culture app. And especially when you were mentioning like people that, like, that's me, you know, yeah. with the coffee cup. Well, that's a whole culture of mine, like same or me right now in the photo of the cat. Like identification is something that's really different. And it's also like part of what I'm interested in is that like in the US specifically in pop culture, it has superseded race. So like people look to pop culture, look to like basketball players who are often black, look to singers who are often of color, um, and always refer to themselves as that. Like not dissimilarly to how like they will post like Kermit the Frog drinking tea to show that they're like watching something with interest, or like Michael Jackson eating popcorn. So like I'm interested in how like this flat identification comes about, and like I don't know what to make. I'm really interested in this. I was just gonna mention. There are also some things that pass beyond individual authorship, I think, when you're talking about you know, something like that. For example, you're talking about uh, the compressed space, right? How mm -hmm. things are flattened out uh, when we observe the viewers in the background. And I think we can only explain that uh, with the particular position of the photographer that is mm -hmm. placed somewhere within this closed space where the game takes place. And then he has to use a specific uh, sort of lens to photograph that from that distance and that sort of lens technically compresses space. So there's already a, a number of uh, given things yeah. that you have to work with as a photojournalist and then the, uh, the aesthetics that's born out of it is somehow supposed to uh, look this way, right? Yeah. Uh, that uh, just to finish, that made me remind, uh, I mean, that reminded me of this um, instance from BBC's Genius of Photography. Mm -hmm. I think it was James I.J., the writer. He's looking through this uh, New York Police Department uh, archives, and then first he thinks that this is uh, one specific author that is of uh, a genius. Mm -hmm. uh, so he's so skilled that he takes these amazing photos, and then he recognizes that it's, in fact, a number of police officers, and they're not exactly the same person, and so there are a few people involved, but all of the images that come out of that uh, effort look more or less the same because there's a given condition that they photograph uh, those things in. So then he thinks maybe it's genius of photography itself rather than this uh, individualistic uh, genius. And maybe finally I would like to ask uh, how do you ever try to maybe uh, come up with an explanation how this continuity is possible from Renaissance to uh, photography of today or what creates this uh, sort of continuity? I mean, I think what creates this continuity is like us trying to like find a shared way of looking at images in a really rich image culture. And that shared way is the history of representation and thus the history of art. Like if we live I think that's like the John Berger argument. Like if we live in a world that has more images uploaded every second than ever existed a hundred years ago then we can't, how do we start making sense of it? How do we start making sense of the fact that like there's so many like images coming out of the same event and the way to do it is by looking at art, is by looking at this like history of art, like Western and non-Western that we share, that is instantly recognizable. It's another thing I'm interested in is like, what do we immediately recognize? Like what are the things that we share? What is the cultural imagination that like embodies like if I say Mona Lisa you know exactly what I'm talking about I know exactly what I'm talking about and then immediately all of us think about all of the versions thereof that we both saw and like we're like on the same visual wavelength for a very long time whereas if I said you know the landscape of the Sahara Desert you'll think about like specific representations I'm assuming you've never been I've never been um, 
I don't know. I like I have an imagination of almost everywhere in the world because of Google Maps or because of art. And I'm interested. Like that's what I mean about like thinking about Paris in the '60s through film. Like I just read a book about like a memoir of like 1960s France, and I realized that like I have an image, and that image is not from the imagination when reading the book. It's from Godard, and that's what I'm interested in. Is like how photography thickens the environment we consider modern. <laughs> think about that line pretty much every day when I wake up in the morning. Mm -hmm. It's maybe also the way the studies lit up more public figures yes. give themselves away to certain poses. That's what I'm interested in is like thinking about football as its own aesthetic system. Like a football pitch being its own where is that image of like on rain next to it's like this is its own aesthetic system. Like it has its own composition, it has like the way it's built vertically, like everything about it, the coloring of it. It's like a canvas. Like exactly like a canvas is something that you respond to and you need like God, what's his name? Minimalist painter who made canvases that were shaped like a square. Adrian? No, like black the black mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wait, like black canvases with like white lines through them? What's his name? <laughs> you need that. Mark Roth, a rock Oh my god. How could all of us artists care? Like, I'm so bad. I'm so bad with names. But like, so he made, he was one of the first people to make canvases that aren't just like rotundas or squares. Like, yeah. he would make canvases that had shapes. Yeah, 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 starts with the next. Yeah. Um, yeah. So like we maybe one day we'll have drone photography that would break our image of like how we experience football. Like I've been I've been to Old Trafford, like this really fancy football pitch and they have like a camera that goes above. And when you see games from there, it feels like a really different aesthetic system because you can see it from above. Um, so like part of what I'm interested in these photographs is that like they're a case study and they're a case study of a really unique and really particular singular aesthetic system. It brings me back to that assassination in Ankara um, a year ago um, with, the, with all the spotlights. Yep. Because, um, that happened in, a, in art gallery, right? Yeah. You know, we talked about light. Yeah, Jerry Saltz wrote about them yeah, as art. It was really problematic right? yeah. in terms of like the distance and painting, yeah. seeing that kind of like, an image as a painting, I think comes with a lot of happiness. I think I appreciate your talking about this topic without talking about pictures of pain, because I think most of the time those relationships are drawn, in, you know, these images of dead bodies. Yeah. And so it's like in terms of innovation, jubilation, and something that's very associated with spontaneity and kind of fluidity, I appreciate that. It's something very stagnant and something that's very actually fluid and moving. Yeah. Um, I think that might just be instinctive. <laughs> I think we talked last night <laughs> about me being scared of pain. <laughs> yeah. Should we drink a beer? Sure. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you.